My name is Alex Graham, uh, and this is the Commissioner Panel for Factual Entertainment, uh, a useful uh, label, I think, uh, allowing us to distinguish uh, these programmes from uh, the entertaining stuff on television that we just make up, uh, and the factual stuff that's just a bit boring. Uh, um, so this is, um, I, 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 however, I should, a caveat here, I, I'm told by my producer that the fact that this is the Factual Entertainment Panel uh, is no guarantee that anyone on the panel will say anything that is entertaining or indeed factual. <laughs> so you have been warned. Um, having said that, we do have a, a, a genuine collection of, of big beasts of uh, television commissioning uh, here. Uh, to my immediate left, uh, Andrew O'Connell, uh, commissioning editor for Factual. Uh, his job title doesn't mention entertainment. Uh, but then he's ITV, so he doesn't need to mention entertainment. <laughs> Everything on ITV is entertaining, by definition. Uh, next to Andrew is uh, Sarah Thornton. Uh, you can tell Sarah what's the discovery because she's uh, not uh, ahead of anything. She's a vice president uh, <laughs> of production and development, uh, factual entertainment. So she does have factual entertainment. And then uh, uh, the, the two other people on the panel are so important uh, that they've actually one job title is not enough <laughs> for either of them. They've both got two. Well, Alison Kirkham, uh, who, uh, next in line. Um, Alison's current job is head of formats, features, and events, uh, but she is soon to be acting controller of factual uh, commissioning. Uh, you all probably read Emma Swain is um, um, uh, taking on uh, the not insignificant <coughs> task of steering uh, BBC through uh, Charter Renewal, so Alison is, is uh, stepping up uh, um, uh, in the near future. Um, and then uh, next to Alison is Liam Humphreys from Channel 4, uh, and he's head of factual entertainment and head of entertainment. Uh, and he's, I think Broadcast described this as, I can't remember if it was a supercharged or a turbocharged <laughs> department, but uh, anyway, I want you to think of uh, Liam as the XR3i of, uh, of, 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 of British broadcasting, uh, and, and you won't go far wrong. Uh, now, what we're going to do is, um, uh, the plan this afternoon, uh, is that each of our panellists has kindly brought along uh, some clips, and, and actually, for once, um, uh, the kind of clips that they're going to show aren't just, I mean, we're going to see some clips that you may recognise, I mean, some of the clips you may recognise because the shows have been out. Um, but but at least, I think I think it's fair to say at least in at least at least one clip from each of our panelists is um, oh can you switch your mobile phones off just that's something I probably should at the beginning um, or at least put them on silent so we don't hear the ring um, you can carry on texting your friends if you want to if you're you know, bored um, uh, uh, so we're going to and I think each, each panelist has kindly brought along at least one clip in some cases a couple of clips of shows which are, you will not yet have seen. Uh, you may have read about or heard about, but they, you won't have seen them yet. Uh, so we're going to be talking as much about what's coming up as, as what has uh, gone before. And then I want to just try and uh, have a, a discussion. Uh, you're all a bit in the dark, but you know I do. I will do my best. If you, um, we will have Q and A at the end, obviously. Uh, but if um, you are really burning to ask a question or take issue with something that one of the panelists or indeed myself has said, uh, don't feel you have to wait till the end. Um, you know, if you sort of wave at me, I will try and uh, come to you early, but we will have time for Q&A at the end. Um, just before we start, um, before we plunge into, we're gonna start with, we're gonna work that way uh, in terms of clips, but before that, I mean, I was slightly joking about factual entertainment, but um, can we just talk a bit about this? I mean, is it, I, I, are, they use, are these useful? I mean, some of you have not even got factual entertainment in your job title. I mean, we're here to talk about factual entertainment, but I mean, do you find these labels useful in terms of focusing your mind, or are they just slightly irrit irritating? I mean, are they just, do you, I mean, do you just kind of, okay, that's my job title, now let's just get on with it, or do you actually find, do you find them useful? I think about it on the way up. Um, I think um, the genesis of factual entertainment as a title I think was, um, it was created around Big Brother. Uh, so when Big Brother was first commissioned, it was which department the Channel 4 should this sit in, and they actually created Factual Entertainment, which I think Julian was then in news, came across to work with some 
Liz Warner, who was then in Features. And it's quite an interesting genesis because, for me, Factual Entertainment is about cross-genre working, and that's where the most interesting programmes come from. So you're, you're looking at factual, you're looking at entertainment, and I think it's, um, it, it, it can be useful in that it does demonstrate that the best ideas come from no, in between those spaces, I think. It can be quite annoying in trying to, terms of trying to define it in a way you can define documentary department or you can define entertainment. It's very simple, but I think that kind of weakness is its strength. I think it's about cross-fertilisation of, of different areas and different genres of television. OK. Anybody else? I think maybe um, viewers don't think of it in those terms. And so it's worth remembering that this is a construct to help us. It's not really about what viewers are thinking about as they're selecting, oh, I might feel like some factual <laughs> entertainment tonight. Um, so I guess for me, I, I think it's useful because it's broad and it means I can do pretty much whatever I want. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't sort of get too hung up on it if you're thinking about what to bring us. I think, you know, you know be, be broad, be kind of exciting, sort of it, just because you don't see it on the channel yet doesn't mean we don't want it. I agree. I mean, I've sat on panels where we've endlessly dissected what, fact, what constitutes factual entertainment. When does it move from factual into fact end before it becomes entertainment? I, I think that's probably quite dull and reductive, but, but at its most basic level, it is saying, let's make programs that are interesting and informative, but it's a really useful reminder that we should also aspire for them to be entertaining and engaging and emotional and pleasurable. So um, it's a good corrective to ensure that we're sort of drawing on the best of both genres without getting too hung up on where the margins are. Okay, so uh, Andrew. I think you, um, you know, mentioned it with, uh, with ITV. You know, it is essentially an entertainment and drama channel. So everything we do has to have an entertainment slant to it. And we're very broad in everything we do and universal in the themes that we take on that factual, you know, for us is factual entertainment and it's general factual as well. It's very okay. broad. I mean, well, let's, I'm, I'd quite like to pick up your point later on, I mean, about, about that sense of it. You're, well, actually, you both made the point about bringing, as it were, techniques from both, you know, so I mean, and, you know, we can talk about formats and structure because I think, you know, there are some, I think the clips will illustrate that in a quite an interesting way. So shall we start with you? And you, um, so you, do you want to just set this, do you want to set it up? You're going to show three clips, I think. Yeah, we're going one to of which I think we might have, well, at least one, of, one show we are sort of familiar with and two that we may not be. Yeah, exactly. Um, the one show uh, we've, uh, everybody should uh, probably is familiar with is Paul O'Grady for the Love of Dogs. But I think that just illustrates exactly what in uh, eight o'clock slot works well uh, for us. It's National uh, Treasure doing a familiar subject incredibly well. Uh, so we've got a clip from that. We've got a clip from a, a show that's coming up uh, that Joe D uh, Clinton Davis uh, commissioned, and that's Trip Advisors. I think those of you who were in the documentary um, session this morning would have seen it, but so hopefully you'll enjoy it again. And we've got one uh, big box, little box, which started last week, 8.30 show, um, and it's a um, road testing show. Uh, but let's have a look. Well, the obvious thing, I mean, I mean, and I don't want to read too much into, you know, the kind of choice of clips there, but I mean, I mean, the obvious thing to say is, you know, you imagine a first clip, you know, pitching it, mm, dogs. Mm, well, if you could get Paul O'Grady, we might do dogs, you know. Um, and yet, and yet, and yet the, the, the two other clips, you know, not a, not a, not a recognisable piece of talent in sight, not a, there's no celebrity, there's no kind of, no, I mean, I, so, I mean, I, I, I mean, I mean, I, I get a sense, it's, I mean, you obviously see, you know, the influence of Gogglebox a little bit here. This is the kind of, you know, but I mean, so, I mean, do you want to talk a bit more about, I mean, it's kind of interesting that these, you've got these two shows which are, you know, kind of very much in this, you know, using the same kind of notion of real people engaging, you know. Um, can you talk a little bit about the gestation of them and, and, you know, do you think this is part of a trend or have you just kind of plucked these out there? I, th I've, I, think, I think it's part of a trend. I think, uh, you know, uh, Gogglebox have got to take a huge amount of credit for, you know, for that, uh, for coming into that space. I think also uh, it's a combination of, uh, you know, for, for a long while we haven't had uh, uh, that many um, ordinary punter-based formats. Uh, so I think that trend's coming back. 
I think for, for us at ITV, we want to mix it up a bit. Uh, have a bit, you know, we have the nine o'clock, the fantastic long lost family. We want to bring that fun element back into the 830s. One's road testing gadgets, so we were looking at how we can get into that space. It's very difficult. Uh, the gadget shows, um, the gadget man, all uh, done on uh, other channels very successfully. I think we, uh, we are looking to do more of ordinary punters doing, uh, you know, journeys. That's uh, the one's holiday um, review show, the other one's gadget road testing. Um, I think it's part of a trend that that's hopefully will continue alongside doing um, celebrity immersive uh, fact entertainment uh, shows that we've got coming up. And uh, uh, we've got uh, Flock Stars that's coming up. That's also, that's celebrities doing one man and his dog. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I, yeah, I think it is something that uh, you know is going to be part of uh, the future. Yes, I saw some. I saw someone tweeting about flock stars today. And they, someone just tweeted, just said, "This is really happening." You know, it's a good, but so you know, but, you know, but it, so it is cel celebrity one man and his dog. It is celebrity one man <coughs> and his dog. Yeah. So um, it's interesting you talked about a cycle because I'm mm. I'm I'm actually old enough to remember Gabby Roslin's the real holiday show, yeah. and it, it, which is, I think it's probably like, what, must be 20 years ago-ish, you know. Um, uh, so, it, I mean, I mean, there are cycles in this, aren't there? I mean, so, you know, this, you know, this, so what do you think is behind it? Is, is it? is it just that people get bored and want to move on, or is there something else going on here? Is it kind of, you know, that, 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 that suddenly real people are back centre stage? I... I, I think I think this. Uh, I mean, real uh, people are back centre stage because I think there 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 is a new, uh, there is a new uh, way of telling a, a really well trodden story. We've had the holiday uh, um, showdown, uh, holiday um, hell. Uh, what was that? Holidays from hell yeah. on, on ITV. I think uh, I think it's just a, a new way into telling diff uh, stories that actually uh, resonate with people because it's real people on real uh, subjects, real issues that, uh, you know, everyday stuff, their holidays, um, gadgets. It's a new way into telling stories in a different way, I think. And engaging with real people, I think, gives it a sense of fun. It gives it a sense of, uh, you know, a reality check and not always having to have a, a presenter or a... So is this a case, Liam, is a case of imitation being the sincerest form of flattery? Is Gogglebox... Do you th I mean, is this a kind of... Are we... Are we, are we is this a post-Gogglebox moment? Are we going to see... Are all of you kind of, have you, I mean, are all of you pursuing this kind of, these kinds of shows? Or are we going to see I, more I of this on all the channels? Yeah, I, th I think there's slightly different shows. I mean, with Gogglebox, it's, it's not, I mean, it is a review show, obviously, but it's, it, it's very much a kind of entertainment offering. But, I mean, we've, we have, um, within Channel 4, looked at whether it's possible to recreate um, that kind of format with with other themes and actually found it very difficult because the, the glue of television is something that everyone can relate to yeah. and it happens. It's so, yeah. it's so contemporary, everyone's got a view on it and you can also catch up with the week's television in, in a weird way in, in kind of one hit. So um, look, there are things you can learn from every successful format, but I think that my <coughs> personal view is you always run into problems if you try and replicate them like for like, definitely. But the things you can take out of it, I think they've worked. How can I use that? How can I prepare that with something else, obviously? And I think that's what's happened here, is that we've taken the, uh, the best uh, out of that, and how do you make it work for your own channel and give it its own USP in the same way as Strictly and uh, Strictly Come Dancing and Dancing on Ice yeah. were able to sit side by side because each channel found a way of making, giving it a, their unique pill. But is there, I mean, as far as ITV is concerned, is there a danger that these guys here who've obviously come along to kind of, what they're really here for is the tips and hints about, you know, they're going to go back into their sad little garrets, you know, at the end of this week and start sweating over, you know, the next big idea. And so isn't the message from ITV a bit, well, actually, to be honest, this is probably what we don't want now because we've done holidays, we've done gadgets. I mean, so we kind of... We're going to, well, at the very least, you're going to wait and see whether these really work, whether you, and actually, even if they do, you probably, on ITV, you probably have got room for a lot more of this kind of show, have you? Well, you know, we, we're, uh, we, we have quite a few pilots coming down the road. We're looking for uh, uh, male-skewed fact entertainment propositions, and we've got, we've got a food um, uh, factual entertainment uh, pilot that we're doing. So we are looking at areas that we haven't done before, 
but it's the way into them that we've got to make sure absolutely chimes for an ITV audience, and that's got to be a real emotional heart to whatever the um, underlying narrative is. So if it is food, food can't be centre of what the proposition is. It's got to be the backdrop. It's got to be an emotional uh, journey for the family, for the person for, you know, uh, who are going through it, and that could transfer to... Um, it could be uh, male things around cars, it could be odd jobs, it could be DIY. There are lots of, you know, lots of areas that we'll go into, but it's got to have a real emotional draw to it. And I mean, the other obvious thing to say about these two clips is they're really funny. They're, yeah. I, mean, there's, I mean, comedy is, I mean, yeah. humour is a big, big part of them. I mean, there's, you know, they're, really, they're really funny. I mean, sort of, you know... And, you know funny, you, entertaining... You kind of all. watch them for that, even if you're not that interested in, you know, yeah. the gadgets themselves. You yeah. just watch them for the... And I think that's what really works for ITV. It's, it, there's a warmth, there's an authenticity to it, there's a real kind of sense of fun and an emotional engagement. Uh, we can't be sneery, we can't be kind of worthy, nothing like that. It's okay. just got to be sheer inter Brilliant. entertainment. Shall we move on? Sarah, so uh, do you want to um, set up? Cause you, so you've got, I think, one clip that we've seen already and then a couple, and, and I'm not sure, have we got, have we got, we were hoping to get two new clips. From. We do. Yes. I'd say this is very exciting. This is genuinely like live telly, um, <laughs> uh, except there's not quite as many people watching. Uh, um, Depends uh, on the channel. Unless it's a Channel 5 show, of course. We can say that because they're not here. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, so we've been uh, actually in, 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 in some cases we've actually been kind of down to the wire in terms of what clips we can get. So you're seeing it here first, guys. Do you want to set up your uh, clips? Yeah. Please? So um, I'll start by telling you what we're not showing, which is a clip from a doc we did earlier this year with Katie Hopkins, which was our only sort of talent-based um, clip that we were going to show. Everybody is gutted not to see it. I mean, there's, there's so little of Katie on television. I know, television. I think you might think want to see a bit more We're disappointed her. not to see some more, I think. Um, but we've had, um, we've had quite a successful year this year, and part of that has been driven by, um, I'd say, working um, on the more factual end of the fact end spectrum. Um, so the three clips we're showing are all quite documentary-based. That's not to say that's, that's all we're looking for, so um, we can talk about that a bit more in... Uh, in more depth. But um, the first clip is from a series called Too Ugly for Love, which was made by Betty. Um, really successful series for us that we're hoping to return. Um, it's an obs doc following people dating. Um, you'll get the rest from the clip. Um, what I love about this, um, and I think that it speaks to in terms of one of our commissioning filters, is that it's incredibly redemptive and warm in spite of its quite cynical title. Um, the second clip is actually a commission, a new commission that's been 12 months in the making. It was brought to me after a session at Sheffield last year. It's a single doc, um, and I think it shows the more serious side of the channel. Um, I think one thing that glues all of our commissions together, whether it be Katie Hopkins or this clip, is that we like, we, we, there's a sense of sort of putting it out there, wanting to break taboos, talk about things that people don't talk about. This is a clip from a self-shot doc um, from a lady called Lisa, who's in the audience, um, and uh, came about after she saw me at the end of the session last year. I think uh, it's about miscarriage, but I think it has an incredible sense of positivity as well. And the third is uh, actually a clip that's not from the series. It's a clip that inspired a series that we've commissioned called Separated at Birth. This is another documentary series um, about unlikely coincidences, serendipity, um, and as you can probably guess, people who've, um, who are reuniting after being separated at birth. What's exciting for me about this and kind of challenging is that it's not territory we've never seen before, but we're hoping to do it in a way that feels quite new and fresh, and it's kind of, we're, we're hoping to bring reunions for the Skype generation. Uh, so, um, can we... Actually, I love, I love, I love, can I just say, I love that moment in Too Ugly for Love where she's about to take a wig off. She says, she looks around and says, is there anyone around? And he's like, you're on telly, love. You know, it's like... <laughs> just the crew. <laughs> it's like, it's just, 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 na just a national television <laughs> audience. I wouldn't worry about it. But anyway, anyway it's, it's, very, it's a lo lovely clip. Um, can we talk a little bit about First Heartbeat? Mm. Do you say that the filmmakers in the... Yes, Lisa Francesca oh, Nand. Hello. She's... Do you want to stand up? Just so we can all see you. <laughs> And Ruth Pitt, the exec producer's next Fantastic. door as well. Um, can we give her a microphone? 
Um, so just, I mean, I think, you know, I don't know about you, but, you know, I, I, I've been coming to Sheffield for years and years and years, and you end up coming to these sessions, you're always vaguely cynical about whether anything ever comes out of them. So could, could you talk a little bit about just how, so, so, so this was yeah. what, literally same time last year? Um, so a year ago, we made a decision, well, probably, probably about a year and a half ago, we made a decision to do more factual commissioning. Um, on our female channels, and uh, sort of we're looking at doing what we what we call female factual, um, which sort of came from um, me feeling like uh, features uh, as as a sort of genre, it can be a bit patronising if you're not careful to women. Um, so I sat on a documentary panel with not many documentaries on our channel at the time, and um, I was approached by well Ruth was the chair, um, and we had a chat afterwards, and then I met with Lisa. And uh, she said, I've got a documentary about um, my miscarriages. And I thought, oh, OK. Uh, and, then, and then I sat down with Lisa in a small room at Discovery and watched a 10-minute clip. And aside from crying quite a lot, because I think I might have been pregnant at the time, um, and it was very moving, I was struck uh, instantly by um, her positivity and the positivity around the film. And actually, there is a happy ending. Um, which Lisa can probably tell you about. Do you want to fill in the gap? Uh, yeah. Well, I, I've got two children now and had a lot of treatment, and throughout the film I talk to other people who have been through the same experience, and I film my video diary over a couple of pregnancies, including losing uh, two more. I've had seven altogether. But I think really it struck me that Sarah, what Sarah said on the, on the commissioning panel last year, which Ruth was the, uh, the uh, chair of, is it just struck me what you said about the channel, about women, and what you were, you were trying to target. It really sort of appealed, and it made me think, you know, that might be the place for us. And actually it was a surprise for me that TLC was, you know, was doing that sort of stuff, because I do watch, you know, and um, so I was really pleasantly surprised, and it's been received really well. And I guess in, in that sense, it's a Sheffield success story, because we were here and you know, and a year later we're here doing that. And I have to say that your reel there was just in incredible. You know, I was, not my bit, but I was, I don't know how everyone else felt, but I was really moved to tears then with the other things that you're doing. I thought it was fabulous. Thank you. She has to say that, though. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you are going to get inundated now. You're not going to get out of the room. It's like, a woman who actually commissions <laughs> at Sheffield. Amazing. I'm sorry, I, I, I shouldn't be doing this. I'm, I'm, I'm entirely abusing my position as uh, not just chair of the session, but chair of Sheffield. But we should do something about the story. This is a really, I love Sheffield success stories. It's very good. There was and another one be... on, the, I think, the arts panel. There was um, someone else who'd got okay. commissioned off the back of Fantastic. The so, hey, guys, it really, you know, don't be cynical. It really works. You know. But, um, Sarah, can I just uh, broaden it out? Because I think what struck me Watching all, watching all the uh, reels, you know, b b uh, ahead of the session here, is uh, the Discovery reel, I mean, I mean, I mean all three of those uh, shows have, have a very strong, what I would call me for want of a better word, documentary sensibility. I mean, there's no, there isn't, I mean, obviously there's an, I mean, I suppose, you know, there's an, there are kind of elements of sort of structuring in there, but they, they feel like, I mean, certainly, uh, um, certainly kind of a first heartbeat, feels like a very classic, for want of a better word, documentary. I mean, so is that a kind of, is that something that, is that a kind of self-conscious thing by Discovery that you want to kind of get back to roots? Because it, it's slightly, I mean, we, we, we've yet to see the, the BBC and Channel 4 clips, but it slightly flies in the face of what I thought was the kind of trend this year, which kind of feels a little bit like formats, you know, formats about, I mean, you certainly Andrew's speaks, your formats about, you know, structured reality. Um, and you're going for a more documentary sensibility. I mean, is that just coincidence, or is there, is there, is there something going on in, um, out in Gunnersbury that we need to know <laughs> about? You know? I think it's probably a mixture of the two. I mean, it is only three clips, and we do have some really exciting um, entertainment formats in development, something that will probably be announced next week, um, and a couple of other things. We're developing a really interesting format with um, a new company called Fizz at RDF. However... Um, there were, I did make a very conscious decision about, must be two years ago now, because a lot of these have been on air already, um, a conscious decision to move away from, I think, what we assume women want to watch, which is uh, traditional lifestyle or features content. Um, I think partly uh, because we, we launched uh, a lot of our channels, a lot of our fact and or entertainment channels with that content, it was doing okay, but not brilliantly. And I had to ask myself quite, sort of ask myself some quite honest questions, which was, would I sit down and watch these shows? And the answer was no. And it occurred to me that actually um, women are quite underserved 
in factual, actually. And um, it felt like a bit of an opportunity. Um, so, uh, yes, we made a very conscious decision to sort of veer off the features and lifestyle path that we were on, move the content in a more factual direction. That said, I do think that this, for me, still sits under fact end. Um, all, of, all of our commissions are, in some way, I think, uh, ha have a slight tabloid bent, at least at, on the surface, not in the way we make them necessarily, but there's a kind of entry point that feels quite tabloid. You would read about it in a women's magazine or in a red top. Um, and I think, you know, the, the way we title our series is quite grabby. Um, but no, I think it is, whether you're making a format or whether you're making um, a documentary, I, I think ultimately what's really important for us at TLC is storytelling. And I think that's what I hope these clips speak to. I mean, the, again, the other obvious thing uh, to pick up from you, Rio, which is, you know, uh, um, echoes what we were discussing um, around Andrew's uh, clips, is, you know, there's not a, uh, not a superannuated celebrity insight. I mm -hmm. mean, this is, these are all, you know, real stories about real people. I mean, no danger of the producer being punched after the celebrity gets mm -hmm. drunk, you know, well, uh, in, in these shows. I am the woman who commissioned Katie Hopkins. Yeah, Let's well, not OK, forget. that's true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so we have. But again, is that is that again? I, I, I'm just trying. To, I don't, I'm not trying to create mm. trends where none exist. But is that you know? Is, is is there a sense in which you know you're moving away from that, or or is it just you've kind of chosen not to share the celebrity shows with us? Uh, we have a really strict filter for celebrities, and that is they have to be contributors. If a, if talent want to be on our channel, some do, um, then uh, they're only there if they if they um, make it through the same filters that we would apply to a contributor. Right. So they must be there because they're passionate about what they're doing. It must be something that they would have done willingly without a television crew following them. And that's been pretty much since day one. And whenever we've forayed outside of that, um, our shows haven't been quite as successful. But, um, you know, it started for me with Jodie Marsh bodybuilding. Um, and, you know, we've just more recently uh, commissioned Katie Hopkins gaining four stone. And, we, we, you know, we do things with Tina Malone. We've got... a uh, sort of studio format coming up, um, and I think the filter will be the same. All the talent on that will be there because they have a genuine passion about something that, that draws them to that show. Um, I, I personally think that that is a really, for us, a really important filter, and it speaks to not just authenticity, but kind of truthfulness with the viewer, which I think maybe, for me, I think is a more important word than authenticity. But it Okay, no, that's, and, and just to be fair, I mean, because, you know, I mean, just to make the point about the Katie Hopkins film, I mean, it's, you know, she, she, is, she is in no way a kind of stuck on um, celebrity. Or, I mean, she is, I mean, it's like Morgan Spurlock, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know super size. I mean, she is deeply engaged in that film. I mean, mm. it's, not, it's not like she's just kind of fronting it. I mean, she's the kind of protagonist subject of the film. Isn't it? You know, we whatever you think of her, yeah. she's passionate and engaged about what she's doing in that film. Yeah. yeah, definitely. We abs we, what we don't have at our channel is a list of celebrities that we'd like to work with. That doesn't exist, and it's a very difficult one. We've, we've been asked to play that game many times, and we struggle. But what we are interested in is celebrity plus project plus okay. passion. Maybe we'll come back and talk about that, because I, I think that's something that, 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 that well, I, you know, sorry, speak for any of the rest of you, but certainly in, you know, when, you know, when I was out there you know, pitching, it's one of the things you always struggle with a bit about exactly, you know, how to position. You know, mm. do you do you attach talent? When do you attach talent? What's the, you know, what kind of, you know, how does that, you know? So we might come back and talk about that because you know, talent features um, later on. Um, can I just just before I move on to Alison, just can you just explain? Uh, you said on the way into the clip. I just wanted to understand the, the nature of that clip. You said that that the separated at birth clip you showed. Mm -hmm. That's not. That, so what was the state? You said that wasn't actually in the series, but it inspired the series. Can so you talk a little bit about how that... Is that a taster then that came? Or, the or series a, a hasn't been made. Right. Um, we're crewing up at the moment. Okay. Uh, that is something we came across on YouTube in the research. Okay. We, so we did a, right. quite a lengthy development to make sure that actually there was enough stories out there that felt quite distinct. Um, our kind of word that we used to sort through cases was this word serendipity and sort of surprise. Um, and that's something we came across, but actually it has massively inspired the way we're going to structure the storytelling of the series itself. Um, and I think that's something, you know, I, I think we have shown a lot of, uh, the three clips I showed do have a kind of very similar feel and tone amongst them, but that doesn't mean that's all we want people to bring us. I think um, uh, we're constantly experimenting with what we do, not just 
with the types of genres that we're commissioning, but also the way we make them. So we're, you know, we're really hopeful that people will bring us stuff, not just what they see on the channel, but what, what they'd like to see on the channel. OK. Um, again, OK, well, that's a whole lot. Well, we, we, once we've been through, we, we'll have some time for sort of broadening out the discussion. But I might come back and talk about that again, because I'm, I'm sort of, I was interested in Andrew's clips kind of having that, that, that relationship they had to, you know, I mean, the travel guides, so, you know, and, and that sense of, you know, that, you know, I mean, obviously there's a Google box element, but there's also a kind of sense of that having a relationship to the growth on the internet of kind of sort of, you know, real, you know, TripAdvisor and, and it's kind of sort of, you know, so we might come back and talk about that, about the internet being a source of ideas. Um, Alison. Um, now, now, you've chosen a particularly marvellous clip to kick off your reel, I have to say. Uh, I, I have to just compliment you on your uh, uh, taste and progress. Um, <laughs> do you want to just talk about the shows that you're going to... Uh, again, in this case, I think we've got a couple of shows that okay. have been out, and one that is um, quite literally hot off the press in the sense that we've only, you've only just announced the talent, talent. Yeah. today. So, yeah. over to you. So the first one, which I think you're referring to, is made by a small company called Wall to Wall. I have nothing um, to do with them anymore. <laughs> I mean, you know, so like yeah. So the first one, I, I think the clips actually fortuitously speak to some of the themes that y it feels like you're developing. So um, the first two, Back in Time for Dinner and Eat Well for Less, were probably our biggest hits on um, two and one, respectively, over the last year. And... Um, I think they're interesting because they're both very much about families. And when you're talking about Gogglebox and then um, some of Andrew's shows on ITV, uh, one of the most interesting things I think seems to be the leg legacy of Gogglebox is that people, people seem to like to see their lives reflected back to them. And, and shows with families mm. seem to be mm. working mm. well um, if they're told in a sort of unpatronising um, way and certainly in both those shows the family is front and center and they're the the start very much the stars of the show um and then the third show is a show that we're doing for bbc one a two-part series um about how britain spends the way they spend i think there's a lot that's been discussed about welfare and um we don't haven't really looked at spending as much and how revealing that can be right across the gamut um, and in it, we're using Anne Robinson. Um, you've talked a little bit about whether uh, presenters are going out of fashion. I think in this series, what's exciting is that you're seeing Anne Robinson in a way that you won't be familiar with her. Uh, she's very immersed in the actuality. You know, she really got stuck in and is, I would say, a contributor in the same way as you were describing with Katie Hopkins. So you, you, uh, hopefully it'll be funny, it'll be interesting, it'll be surprising. Um, you can't query her commitment to the project, certainly. <laughs> Very good. Um, I love that clip from Eat Wealth. You could, you could feel the collective and take <laughs> a breath. <laughs> so, yeah, so as you say, I mean, it's almost like we planned this session, actually, in advance. Right? I mean, the, 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 the themes that are emerging. But, I mean, um, but it's interesting. I mean, again, you know, you've got, uh, you know, I mean, all right. In, in Eat Well for Less, you're kind of mediated through Greg, and so, you know, so you have a kind of... But, but nonetheless, um, it feels very much like we are, you know, inside, you know, and, and, and dealing with... I mean, what Liam was saying earlier about the universe, how difficult to kind of move on from Gogglebox because television is such a universal thing, but then so is shopping and eating, you know, and so, you know, so it's a, it, 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 finding ways into that kind of universal experience, again, with real people, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the challenge, especially when you're commissioning for the really broad channels like One or ITV. The, the, you know, you can't vary the subject areas that much. They, they need to be broad subject areas that resonate with people's lives across the country, so, which is why people keep returning to subjects like food. The challenge is how we tell it in different ways. Um, and certainly, I think, you know, the fashion with the audience and, and so with commissioners and programme makers at the moment... I think is still for authenticity and sort of revering everyday life, reflecting it back. And, and there is, it is lightly mediated. And in fact, interestingly, Eat Well for Less, you know, there's no death of presenter altogether. Eat Well for Less um, was developed as a project for Chris Bavin, who was brought to us as a complete unknown. And he just was incredibly appealing and warm. And he felt like talent that could land on BBC One. So you really can launch new talent onto big channels. And the project was developed 
from that as the starting point. Um, but if you watch it, it's not incredibly formatted. It still plays out in quite a docky fashion, I would say. And they go on, you know, the cliché journey, and there's a degree of transformation. Um, and it's only very lightly mediated. And, and so can you talk a little bit about the, the genesis of the, the Anne Robinson project? Was that, a, was that an idea? Um, were you brought... Was Anne sort of integral to that from the beginning, or was that an idea you had and you, then you went out and looked for a, a piece of talent that was going to work? How did that come about? I mean, a bit of both, really. Um, I've worked with Anne for a long time and um, know that it's a subject area in which she's very interested spending. Um, and then we were. very good at it, yeah. <laughs> Unashamedly. Um, and uh, it, we were talking to the garden about the territory um, and, and about how private. British people tend to be about their spending, yet how quick and happy they are to judge the spending of others. Yeah. Um, and could we, was there something in that? Um, and then we sort of married the talent with the territory and it really started to come alive. And, and she was great to work with on it and she mm. was involved in the development of it. And just, just, just for the, for the for, to help the audience here, so it's a, it's a two part. It's a two part, right? so it's sort and, of a two And, and are there, is it kind of then, does she. Is it, a, is it basically a series of encounters or is yeah. it structured? Yeah. yeah, it's a series yeah. of encounters. I mean, along the way, you will gain an understanding of what Britain at large spends their money on. But it's a series of encounters um, from ac across the social spectrums, really. Um, just really colourful thumbnails, entertaining, but that allow you insight into different ways to spend. And crucially, what we value. It's not just sort of spending per se, it's what I, it says about us and what we value and how we judge what others value. Um, and it's really entertaining. It's jaw-dropping at times. And I think it's one of those, those programmes that makes you reflect on, on your own spending and, and your own... In the same way that Eat Well does. You know, you watch that and you sort of no, think, no, God, no, I would no, got, be slightly I terrified would, if someone was stapling together all my receipt, you know, so I, I think it's... It kind of makes you want to go back and do the exercise yeah. yourself, doesn't it, yeah. in a way? Or not, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> not too frightened too close. And back in time for dinner, I mean, joking aside, you know, I mean, I, obviously I had hoped that <laughs> soon after I left... Wall to wall would just crash and burn, you know, without me, but sadly they seem to be doing quite well. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, but, you know, uh, far from being for me to go. But I mean, it's, a, it's interesting, isn't it? Because it's, you know, that is, I mean, in, even in Wall to Wall's own terms, that's solidly in a quite long tradition, isn't it? That sort of begins with 1900 House and kind of carries on through, you know, I mean, it's. it's a, what was we making that show or, or variants of that show for quite a long time? But it keeps, but it keeps working. I think there was a bit more specificity, perhaps, um, in the prism that we were looking through. Yeah. It really came at the history through food. So it told post-war post social history through the food that we eat. And it obviously sat within the food season on BBC Two. Um, so that allowed us, you know, you go back to familiar subject areas, food. That allowed us to... You know, cue on a plate, we were able to bring sort of botany to the audience and alongside gardening and cooking. Um, we, d we did Britain's favourite foods and are they good for you? You're able to bring nutrition and health. And, and back in time for dinner, certainly we'll to all have expertise. But I think if you can, the onus is on us to slightly shift the form and reinvent how we're telling the stories. And I think by focusing in on food, it, it really struck a chord. I also think, um, and this potentially will neatly segue into Liam, that it, it felt quite scary to stay with one family across the series. We were asking one family to carry six episodes and there were sort of dissenting voices who felt that we should have cast a different yeah, family yeah. in each episode. And certainly Anne and I really wrestled with that and it, it made us uh, anxious that the bar had to be incredibly high for the family. But I'm so pleased we stuck with that because what it allowed us to deliver was, I think, sort of a grown-up reality show on one level. You know, that you saw this family transform through yeah, the decades and their um, journey just felt much more immersive and, and real because they lived through it all. So, for example, at the end of the 50s episode, and they'd only been living the 50s for about eight days, uh, rationing came to an end and we sort of delivered bacon and eggs, and they were euphoric. Um, so they really, you know, I think it made it more vivid because yeah. they were going through the transformation in the same way that with the island, on some level, I think that's a grown-up reality show, and I say that as a compliment. And when you talk about fact tens, I think if these shows can engage 
us intellectually but also emotionally and take us on these transformative journeys, they're all the better for it. So, so we'll, we'll come on and talk about the island in a moment. Yeah, but, um, I mean, with back in time for dinner, I mean, obviously it's been a big hit for two. I mean, is, is it, you know, is, is, is that a show you think, I mean, so what would you do for series two? Would you get a new family? Or would you kind of find a new subject matter? Or what, I mean, is it a show that can is that a show that can come back? Or not? I'd like to think so. Definitely something we're discussing with Wall to Wall. Right. Not that I have <laughs> Our any press team interest is at all. There, so. but, you know, anyway. <laughs> no, but no, but clearly, yeah. Um, right. So Liam. Uh, so again, well, actually. You have, I've only seen two of you, you've got three clips, and actually, I've only seen two of them, because the, the third one apparently um, had to come in a sealed, lead-lined <laughs> box <laughs> delivered by G, G4S or whatever um, uh, um, only this afternoon, so I haven't even seen the third clip. So maybe, <clears throat> do you want to just explain the two clips I have seen, and, and then for my benefit, if no one else sees the, the one I haven't yet seen? Yeah, um, I just echo Alison's point about universal themes, I think. Um, themes don't necessarily go out of fashion, I think. Um, our presentation of them does, so especially at Channel 4, what we always strive to do is innovate in how we tell stories and, and, and the form we take to tell those stories. And I think these three clips will hopefully illustrate that. The first is of the island, which is you know, taking the traditional genre, which is um, the adventure and survival, and it's raw, it's visceral, and it's basically a format with the format taken out. The second clip um, is of a travel show, but it's... Um, using a, an anti-lifestyle lifestyle presenter. So I think, in a way, it's kind of all in the water of, of traditional features, and I'm very proud of the result. And then, finally, um, the Group 4 clip that came up <laughs> by Sakura Van um, is... Uh, it's, it's a successive piece of the Undateables, not the Undateables is in old age. It's still, you know, it's on the back of two BAFTA nominations. It's still in rude health, but it's, you know, a strategy is to find something new to say in that space and it's a, a new series with Michelle Rue so it's actually taking existing talent and hopefully reinventing them as well but looking at them in a similar kind of space. So, uh, it's it's on, on the island it's, you know, it's, it's, it's always the Glaswegians that crack first isn't it, you know, it's like, you know, it's like, you know you'd, be, you'd be stuck in an island with a Glaswegian. Um, um, so, well, a couple of things, I mean, let's, let's, let's start with the Michelle so, just, just uh, what stage? I mean, are you sort of? I mean, uh, uh, I mean, this is a, this is hot off the press. So, what, what stage is the Michel Rue? At? It's in the second week of filming, so um, it's it's about probably about uh, one fifth of the way through at the moment. Right, right, right. And I mean, uh, it's interesting. Just coming back to the themes again. I mean, uh, it's a very brief clip, obviously. So, you know, difficult. but I mean, even on that very brief clip, you get a sense that this is. Uh, this is not going to be that easy a gig for Michel. You know, it's kind of this is he's you know he's this is going to be quite a demanding. You know, I mean, it's, I mean, it, it means like slightly. Of, I mean, I mean, Jamie. I mean, Jamie's 15. You know, and the kind of sort of you know the kind of you know that you know if this if this works. You see that you know he's going to have to really yeah. deliver I, himself. You know? I hope I hope it takes him out of, out of his comfort zone. Um, yeah. it is uh, I think authentic. Um, he does actually. Um, he's part of a charity which um, trains um, disadvantaged and, and, and disabled um, uh, kids uh, in, in, in catering. You know, Remploy has all sorts of problems. Well, Remploy isn't, I understand, the, the force it once was in terms of getting disabled people into the workplace. So um, it's, you know, it, it's part of what we do at Channel 4 in terms of bringing, um, redefining the, the, the remit, hopefully, for a modern generation and making traditionally difficult subjects accessible and entertaining for um, a young audience, um, but it's also taking pre-existing talent. I've always really admired him, but we couldn't just import him and use him in the same way. So I think it's hopefully going to take him out of his comfort zone and people will see a different side of him they haven't seen before. So hopefully it'll be innovative. And, and just talk a little bit about that, you know, I mean, the, I mean for those who haven't uh, seen it, I mean, the, the concept behind Travel Man. I mean, because it's kind of, <clears throat> I don't know, I feel quite ambivalent about it in a way. And, and wanna, it's very, very funny. But I'm also sort of slight, I get slightly annoyed with Richard. If you don't like football, don't go to a fucking football museum. You know, but I mean, sort of, yeah. but it's, you know, and it's, you know, the thing about Richard, I think he's a genius, but he's Marmite. And if you love Marmite, yeah, you yeah, love yeah. him. No, I, love, I, mean, I love Marmite. He's one of yeah. my favourite presenters. Um, I never get bored of, 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 of watching him. His, 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 his voiceover scripts are remarkable. Um, but what I really love about it is it's taking a, a, a traditional feature space 
and kind of just inverting it and popping it inside out and making it really interesting again, I think. And I think we're all slightly tired of um, didactic experts telling us what we should and shouldn't enjoy with our lives and what we should be doing. And actually, it's something quite refreshing for me, watching someone who um, plainly finds everything quite uncomfortable, but um, just delivers in, in, in entertaining spades. So talk a bit more about just, I mean, we, we, you know, reflecting on talent. So, I mean, in terms of these clips, but just generally, I mean, the, the Channel 4 view about, you know, we talked to you about, you know, the, 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 bar, the bar or the benchmark for talent. I mean, what, can you talk a little bit about how you view that, you know, in terms of people pitching to you? What, what's your sort of, do you have a set of criteria? Gosh, about what? I, I don't know. Um I mean, you kind of know great talent when you see it. It's someone who you all want to watch and engage with. Um, I, th I, think, I think it's fair to say that traditional um, lifestyle presenters and, and makeover experts um, are probably... It's not their moment in the sun at, at the moment. I think those kind of makeover formats are, are a bit tired. And, and I think, you know, I think... Um, you know, Bear's an in interesting point. I think he's very much at the margins of, 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 of that uh, idea, and it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't be the same programme. Indeed, I, I, you know, I don't think it would work in the same way at all if he was actually on the island in, in, in the middle of it. So, um, would I it think, work without him? Um, I think it would be more difficult without him. I'm sure it would work without him, but obviously he brings something unique to it and, mm -hmm. and some, you know, initially some credibility um, uh, and... I think he gives good context to the scenes, but you know, the, the heart of what happens in that show is undoubtedly on the island itself. Okay, can we? I mean, I've got a couple more questions that I'd quite like to uh, tease out the panel. But can we? Um, can we have the lights up? We've got about we've got about 15, 20 minutes left. Um, so I just want to encourage you to. I know you're a very Sheffield audience is a very shy and retiring by nature, so it's very hard to get. Um, have we, got any, have we got anyone who's wanting to ask a question right now? <laughs> That's good, okay. So, do you want to have a think? And then <laughs> we'll keep the lights up. And then if you're sort of anybody's in, inspired to uh, ask something, then we'll, but Can we just um, come back to... <coughs> um, I was really struck by... Uh, Sarah talking about um, uh, separated at Bath and kind of, you know, this, this is actually the, the, like you find a YouTube clip. I mean, uh, the rest, I mean, the, the, the panel general, I mean, just going to go, I don't know who wants to go to it, but I mean, is that, do you think that is, I mean, it, are, in terms of what you get pitched or in terms of, you know, is this, is this an increasing phenomenon that people are kind of bringing you stuff? I mean, do you encourage people to bring you stuff that, so that they've kind of, Uncovered, and the, the, you know, the, or, or, or are you a bit wary of kind of stuff that they? One of our um, successful uh, series um, started off as a one-off last year that we've just commissioned six more of. Uh, is caught on camera, and that all came from UCG uh, generated content through dashboard cams, body cams, and uh, you know uh, clips coming from from the internet. Um, and uh, so we've developed that and we're expanding it further and we've got a couple of others that are in that space as well. So it feels like, uh, I don't know how, how, much, you know, how much more we'll do, mm -hmm. but what we are doing seems to be very successful and uh, you know, uh, so we've commissioned another six. It goes back to what Liam said, the onus is on us to innovate in terms of the form and, um, and I don't think the form can ever take centre stage. You know, you need substance to the content and the narrative arc. But if the form is innovative, then that's really, really useful. And actually, certainly in my memory of commissioning, I don't think there's ever been a moment where both channels were quite so prepared to take risks and to innovate. So I don't think we get enough. I, too, too often, I think... Um, People see what's working, and so they pitch more of that. And actually, what would be lovely is more surprises and, and stuff that felt a little bit more difficult to deliver or, uh, or more unusual for both channels. Liam? Yeah, I mean, I agree. There's, there's, there's nothing worse than, than aping um, something which is already working. I, th I think it's all about the best ideas always feel kind of, not box fresh, but, but you know, more than that, they feel, they feel, they feel raw and new and difficult to make and um, 
I think it's, it's so important not to try and replicate what's already out there. You, you, I mean, you, the best you'll ever get to, I think, is going to be a B. You know, it's very, very difficult to get beyond that. I mean, this is a slight danger with sessions like this, isn't it? That you kind of, you all come and you show your clips, and it's like the danger, everyone goes away and goes, oh, right, you know, that's what they want. Whereas, of course, in a sense, I mean, I don't know if any of you want to talk a bit more about that, you know, about, I mean, I was making a point to Andrew and saying, well, actually, do you want more, you know, big box, little box, or, because, or are you now likely to be? I mean, so, I mean, so what would you say? I'm going to start with Liam, but I mean, what would you say in relation to those clips? I mean, I mean, in terms of, you know, the people out there who are thinking, what am I going to pitch to him, you know, next month? Or, you know, what would you want people to take away from what you've shown them here? I think, I, I think it's, it's a difficult question. I think not my advice to people is always just, you, you've got to love the idea you're pitching. And, and if you genuinely love the idea you're pitching and, and, it, and it's something you're burning to make and you're not, they don't want to hear about it. What I, what I always worry about is people pitching me stuff they think I want. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, the, the ideas you want to engage with are the things that, things that people are really, really passionate about. And the more ambitious, the better. And then hopefully we'll find a meeting point where we can, you know, our, our, our views agree on it and we can find a way to make it. I mean, that would always be my, my, my strongest point of view. I, I, I'm, I'm not one to just pointing one down one avenue or, or another, I think, to begin with, it's got to come from yourselves. Um, what you really love. Oh, good. We have a question. Thank you. Well, the, the, the floodgates. Oh, two <laughs> questions. Well, the floodgates have, 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 have opened. Uh, so we, a, a question at the back. Can you wait for the microphone? Because um, uh, before you... And can you tell us who you are, unless you're sort of not supposed to be here for some reason? <laughs> um, Um, hi, I'm Helena Brown. I'm a development producer for Wingspan Productions at the moment. Uh, you've all talked really clearly about the themes that you have in common, and we sort of saw the commonalities between you. I just wondered if you could say anything about what makes your channel distinctive from the others. OK. Uh, well, well, who wants to take that first? So what, what, what marks you out from this, all the others? I think with, with ITV, um, uh, we've got to hit such a big audience. Um, we have got to be broad. Um, we've got to have impact. We have no hiding place. Um, so the way we get into, uh, the, well, the subjects, for example, we, we will look at a number of subjects, but it's how we get into it and how we're going to make it accessible to reach the widest audience possible. So we've got to get those big universal themes broad, uh, be as broad as possible. But... At, at the same time, be interesting and innovative. And I, I hope with some of the clips that we showed today, there's a bit of surprise in there for what otherwise people always think ITV's got a, a face, um, a personality going on a journey. But actually, we're getting more involved with family, relationships, and that's where it works well for us because it reflects back on people's lives. It's about people's lives. And it's what matters to people. Holidays is aspirational, it's warmth, um, and all those general themes. But we've got to be broad. Um, and universal um, in, in, in our themes. Um, and, you know, we've we, we, we got no hiding place, so we've got to have impact. So, so. you're a little bit different, I guess, in I'd, terms of... Yeah, I'd say we're probably quite different. We are, we are uh, I, uh, less broad in terms of our desired audience. However, um, that doesn't change the need for um, universal touch points. Um, we describe ourselves as a real-life entertainment channel, and I think that speaks to our filter for talent. Um, I think there has to be an authenticity and truthfulness about anyone who's participating in a show for us. Um, I think ultimately in terms of commissioning and what sets our, uh, what characterizes our commissioning is that there has to be uh, a, a, an entry point that is captivating. It needs to feel, I guess on the one hand, you could describe it as tabloid. On the other, I think you could think about it as I think I used the expression earlier of sort of putting it out there. We should be talking about things that not everyone talks about. Um, and, and I, I so see that really as, a, as an essential job for the content that we deliver. And then I think whatever we do, um, it's ultimately about storytelling. But telling stories in, uh, as my colleagues have said, in an innovative, challenging way, that if you are flicking past the challenge, past the channel, you, you will be surprised by and captivated by. Okay. Awesome. 
Um, I mean, you've commissioned for, well, actually, Sarah is too big, you, but you've commissioned for a bunch of channels, aren't yeah. you? Aren't you? Yeah. I suppose the breadth of opportunity is interesting at the BBC, and I think that that's quite a useful thing to remember when you're pitching to the formats and features bit. If we loosely think of it as being popular factual, you know, the aspiration is that it will rate and will we'll commission returning series, but I think... It, 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 these shows need to have conviction and a useful thing to sort of ask yourself is, does it borrow heavily from another genre? And things that work well for us tend to either have a sort of strong current affairs bent. You know, we did a couple of seasons, When I Get Older or Cost of Living season, that felt quite purposeful in a current affairs way. Or do they feel much dockier? On BBC Two, we did... Um, the estate agent show, under offer estate agents on the job? Or does it feel more entertaining? We've just commissioned a couple of really NT fact temp formats for BBC One, and there's a huge appetite for them on BBC Two as well. Or does it feel more specialist factual, like Q on a plate? So um, there is, there is a, I don't want to be too prescriptive. You know, our audiences on both channels are broad. It's a, a big demographic range. It's a fairly equal male-female skew. Um, but there is a real breadth in terms of the subject areas we can cover, and I think the best ideas have a strong conviction in at least one, if not more, of those directions. It's the sort of bland middle ground that, I, uh, that I'm trying to avoid, if that's yeah. useful. Um, I think we... In, innovation's at the heart of what we do. I think that's uh, true in terms of um, subject matter and of tone. Um, I think we, we have to be first to market, um, and we also um, need to be high concept because I think that's the way that we can um, take take what could be difficult or dry subject matters and package them up for um, a young and modern generation and deliver the remit. We had an no, thank you good no question there. Yeah, have we got any more questions? Oh, we've got, good, we've got and uh, have we got more than oh we. Got, we got Mike. Right. So okay, let's let's because we, we haven't got a lot of time. So can I just? I've got one, two. If we got if we find a third question. We can put them all together. Oh, well, let's just take these. We got, all right, good. Yeah. So let's take let's take three questions and then we can try and answer them all at once. Okay. okay. My question is really that um, there is a lot of natural rivalry between departments in any broadcast, sort of healthy, I suppose. But um, when you were talking about um, surprises, Alison, maybe. Um, you know, is there a room for more collaboration between departments so that maybe something that comes in as a doc idea um, in the hands of somebody in fact N becomes something else, but maybe you miss that opportunity because the producer may not have spotted it and you're not sharing it internally. It's just a question, really, whether or not you think there's enough collaboration across departments. OK, let's hold that thought. Um, at the back... Sorry, there we are. Hello. Cool. Hi, I'm Nadira. Um, this is a question about advertisement, so this might not uh, be relevant for the BBC. Um, to what degree um, are you influenced by advertisement time? So, for example, ITV, your three films were um, Holidays, which, of course, you can sell Thomas Cook adverts, and then you had the product placement documentary where they had different products, and then you had the Barcelona ad was kind of... you had the documentary where they went to see a Barcelona tourist guide. So are you at all influenced by product placement, but also advertisement for the viewing time? So, so just to be clear, is you, yeah. your question is, to what extent are these to guys influenced does it, by, who, by, by, by who they're going to sell ads to exactly, when to, they commission? To okay. what extent does it affect the commission process? To right. what, Yeah. Okay. Uh, and there was one more question in front, thanks. Hi, I'm David. Just a quick question. We're talking about crossover here, and we're talking about entertainment, but there's nothing in anything that you showed us that actually brought in the arts, music, um, drama, and sort of more structured, formalized, scripted entertainment. And I'm wondering if, if factual entertainment, popular factual, embraces music, drama, that kind of thing as well. Well, I think what they're going to say is that they, the, 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 these broadcasters all have different departments that kind of, you know, so there are kind of specialist factual arts, music well, departments. Well, sometimes but, it does, the choir. For yeah, but, kind of, so, but, but, but it also kind of, it also echoes this question about <clears throat> um, collaboration between departments. So I don't know, so we've got collaboration between departments, which kind of might embrace, and also maybe you could take on board the kind of arts, music, you know, is there room for that? And then we have a question, which I think probably, as rightly says, probably not one for Alison, but which is about, um, which is about, you know, 
You, uh, to what extent are you just going out there commissioning? For, well, there's two slightly separate issues, isn't there? I mean, one is, are you thinking, you know, to what extent are you thinking at all about ads, even in a broad sense of demographics, you know? Uh, and then there's a kind of slightly separate question about product placement. So shall we start with the collaboration between departments? Does anybody want to take that on in terms of a... Uh, I, I actually, to answer your question, I think there is a lot of collaboration and I think there could be a lot more. Uh, you, the, I can't speak for other broadcasters, though my sense is it's, it's fairly similar. But, uh, people like each other in commissioning at the BBC. Surprise, surprise. And, um, and there is quite a lot of, lot of collaboration, and I can answer both questions. Uh, for example, the big painting challenge was a collaboration between Arts and Tom McDonald. So that was really across the department. Do I think there's enough? No. I definitely think that we should... Uh, and that's not because peop there's an antipathy. It's just because time is scarce and you need to provide people with the opportunity to collaborate more and that's certainly something I'll be thinking about over the next year when I'm acting up but it's a good thing and we should try and do as much of it as we can because you're right I think often the best ideas are born out of people working with different bits of the department and thinking in different ways about ideas. And does this, does, is, this, is this partly what lies behind the sort of, you know, your new Audi Quattro turbocharged <laughs> entertainment <laughs> department? <laughs> um, it's, it's a really big theme at Channel 4. Over the past year to 18 months, there have been regular um, uh, meetings between departments um, at an elementary brainstorming level, at a scheduling level, um, and it's really bearing fruit. There's the, the, the now a number of really high-profile commissions um, at Channel 4 which have two commissioning editors working on them, and they're from different departments. So it's something we're deliberately doing because, A, it, it fosters a better create, creative atmosphere um, and, and, and results within the channel, but also um, people bring different skills to, to programmes, and they feel different on screen as a, as a result. I think um, collaboration means a slightly different thing where we are because we're a network with um, quite a few different channels with um, obviously very different audiences. But... Um, I, I guess I would say that um, obviously Discovery is not necessarily known for the type of content that my department put out. Um, and uh, we spend a lot of time with our factual counterparts, and I'd say, uh, but at a very early development stage and a sort of strategic stage rather than a, a kind of production stage. And I think it's incredibly valuable, incredibly important. And, and um, uh, an example of that was. Um, uh, a, a series uh, made with a guy called Ed Stafford, actually, who um, self-shot uh, himself walking the Amazon. Um, and, and that's inspired quite a lot of content that I think you'll see coming through on TLC in the next year or so. And, Andrew, uh, we, um, we were talking just before the session started, you, you were talking about how <coughs> ITV, I mean, you know, it's, just, it's just factual. And there's, there's, you, are, you are quite a small team. Um, so, in that sense, presumably... Collaboration doesn't it isn't such an issue in the sense that you are all kind of pretty much in the same room already. We're we're all in the same room. We walk, uh, we all work across uh, all the um, uh, factual genres, uh, be it natural history or um, you know if we're doing DIY um, shows, etc. The docs presenter led. So we all work together as a team. There is some collaboration with the digital channels. Uh, but not a huge amount. They have their own commissioning team, but there's three or four commissions that we would do um, co collaborate over. But yeah, small team. So. Okay, and um, and the question about commissioning for um, how much do you think about ads when you are the, the advertiser when you're commissioning? I watch them at home. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's product placement and uh, is a growing trend obviously it's more it's more to do with daytime commissioning in peak um uh the honest truth is you don't think about it you think about the tone of the program the, pro the adverts think about us we don't think about them uh, similar with us uh, we um you know we get the uh, we're interested in the program and the story uh what the uh, format is and then we would if it is like big box little box or trip uh, trip advisor we would um let the um uh, advertising uh, side, arm of the company know what we're doing but i've only been there a year and i've had we've had you know we've had no pushback on anything and if and just and just to be clear i mean so if if someone came to you with an idea and said, you know, I've got, you know, a gazillion pounds from 
Hasbro or you know Mars or whatever to, to, to fund us. Is that a good? Is, is, do you instantly think, "Woo, that sounds good," or do you instantly think, mm, "I'm not so sure." Honest reaction. Yeah, honest reaction. <laughs> honest reaction is um, part of me shrinks inside. Yeah. And I think it's <laughs> it's not it's <laughs> not it's not. Um, it's not the most the, 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 the greatest start for creative conversation. Yeah. I mean, you know, if, if the idea has come first and then there's money, then you find money en route, then that's great. Yeah. But if the, if, the, if the starting point of the conversation is, I've got loads of money, let's find an idea, yeah. then um, I'm quite wary of it. Do you know, I think there's a bit of a myth that if you come to a broadcaster armed with loads of money, you'll get a really quick, easy commission. And I'd say, in my experience, they're the hardest commissions to get through because ultimately we commission around the idea and the content. And, and what often happens as you get down the line of development um, with ad-funded uh, content is you end up in a place that, that, where you can't reconcile yeah. it with, with your kind of commissioning filters. Not True. to say we wouldn't try. So, yeah. Um, we're out of time, I'm afraid. Uh, um, I'd uh, like to thank you. Um, and there's been a, you know, about you, but I found fa fascinating clips. Can I just ask you all, before you disappear, to put your hands together for Andrew, Sarah, Alison and Leo? Thank you.